Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. My name is Al. I'm an alcoholic and addict. And I'm powerless over everything. And I kind of feel like that I've been in a hatchet fight and everybody had one with me right now. It's good for me to be here. I would like to thank Walter and the board of the Robinson House for inviting me over to share in this benefit, which I've noticed to see the gentleman stand up with one year, one day at a time. I never know what I'm going to say when I'm asked to speak, or I never know what I'm going to say when I raise my hand in a meeting to share. But when I say I'm an alcoholic and an addict, and I'm powerless over everything, and I have a feeling illness, that I say that primarily for myself, because I don't want to ever forget one thing that I think is very important that I've learned. Knowledge alone will not keep me sober. I've always had a lot of knowledge. All of us in this room has got a lot of knowledge. We're very bright. We're very intelligent. Maybe that's why we all here together. <laughs> <laughs> but see, the book tells me that it was one thing that was always lacking. The lack of power was my dilemma, not the lack of knowledge. I didn't have the power. And I'm here tonight to try to do something that I can do better, I guess, than anyone else in the world. And that share my experience, strength, and hope and share my life with you all. And I can do it better because I'm the one that lived it. And I no longer can, uh, when I'm standing in a position like this, I always humble myself to that power that I choose to call God that maybe I don't necessarily understand. And, and today, I'm glad that I try not, I don't use my brain to try to understand God. The literature tells me that uh, I'm not supposed to do that. I just, my sponsor told me this. He said, long as you know that you are not it, you okay. <laughs> And I heard a guy say something in a meeting a couple of weeks ago when he was sharing. <laughs> and it had never formed in my mind the way that he said it, but it was true for me. He said part of his problem always was that he could always, would always get along with anybody in the world. No soon they recognized that he was God. <laughs> You know, it's uh, we're supposed to share a little bit about what what I was like, not what it was like. What was I like? And see, I can easily talk about the birds and the bees and everybody else and everything, but when it comes to talking about Al, it's very difficult. I uh, identify with and how it works when it says that some of us suffer with grave emotional and mental disorders. But many of us do recover if we have the capacity, to be honest. And it also says that alcohol was just a symptom of deeper mental and emotional disorders. So what I'm trying to say tonight, standing here, is I had the disease before I drank the alcohol. See, the alcohol is in the bottle, the ism is in me, and when I mix the two, that makes alcoholism. <laughs> See, when I was, when from the time I first could remember myself, I never felt, you notice I said that I have a feeling illness. That doesn't mean that I'm any different than anyone else. I've learned over the years that I'm more like people than I am different. 
But see, I have an illness that is self-destructive. The nature of my illness will force me to destroy myself or either force me to change. So I'm not self-righteous and I'm not a good at two-shoes, you know. I'm not one of these that's going to heaven anyhow. <laughs> I want to go, but I ain't ready right yet. I'm still scared of the unfamiliar. <laughs> but when I was young, and I first could remember myself, as I look back over my track record, over my, my, my life, the first feeling that I could identify with, even though I couldn't hook a name up to it, I'm talking about a feeling, was the feeling of rejection. See, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, I don't ever remember living with a mother or father or having a sister or brother. And I felt out of place. I always felt all my life like I was over here and everyone else was over there. And I recall at a young age that I, used, I told my grandmother how I wanted my mother and father to get back together so I could have a home like the rest of the kids. And she told me maybe if I wrote my mom and told her how I felt, that maybe she and my dad would get back together again. Now, I don't remember what I put in the letter to my mom, but I haven't forgot to this day the response that she wrote back. And in so many words, she was saying it was none of my business, I didn't have nothing to do with it, and to keep my mouth out of it. Right there, I began to feel that rejection, and I began, as I know today, to hate, to learn how to hate my mother. And that was going to, unbeknown to me, that was going to transfer as I grew older into any females that I met. I would misplace a lot of my anger and hostility. They would get it because they was the closest thing to me, but really it was directed to my mom. And as I began to grow up with this feeling of not being a part of, you know, I had to learn through a lot of hard knocks how to put calluses around the part that the human eye can't see because what you see standing behind this podium is not air. That's the mistake that a lot of people make. That's the mistake a lot of people make with people like myself. This is just the vehicle, the meat house that take Al around from place to place. Al live inside this skin and bone. And if you don't know my feelings, you don't know me. And people used to tell me when I was growing up, and I'd try to explain to them how I felt. They would say stuff to me like, you shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> Hell, I didn't want to feel that way. <laughs> So I guess I began to take the attitude that I must not be like other people, that they could turn their feelings of insecurity and inadequacy and, and frustration and fear and revenge and resentment and envy and jealousy and all of that stuff. They could just turn it on and off like a water faucet. See, but I couldn't do mine like that. So I had to learn how to protect Al, not the physical part but the part that the eye couldn't see. If you can imagine in your mind a duck sitting on a pond in a, on a bright, calm, sunshiny day with not a ripple in the water and look like he's just sitting right on top of the water just like that. But if you look underneath, his feet is going just like that. That's the way my gut used to go all the time. And I learned how to let people hear what I thought they wanted to hear. And when they'd say to me, Al, how you doing? I'd say, oh, just fine. I'm just, and I'd ready to kill something right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm doing fine. <laughs> See, I, I, I was brought up in an environment where the projection of what a man was supposed to be, that men didn't cry, men didn't ask for help, Men didn't tell women they loved them. Men didn't do this. Men didn't do that. 
Men did what they wanted to do when they got ready and stopped doing what they didn't want to do if they didn't want to do it. <laughs> and I tried to live up to that. I tried to live up to that. So regardless of how I felt, okay, I was one that could carry around a lot of masks in my pocket, imaginary masks. In whatever situation that I was in at any given time, I could pull out the proper mask to put on. And I thought, and people thought I was normal. Just like all of y'all said, not that, y'all look normal. <laughs> Real normal. See, the wolf man looked normal too. <laughs> but see, I had to go through a lot of, a lot of strife and despair and rejection and disappointment and all that in life to find out after getting in A, read the literature, and the book says that we are not normal people. <laughs> I've spent all those years trying to be something that I never could be. And that's a normal person. And it wasn't until my illness forced me to accept that fact about myself that my life began to get better. As I said, growing up, I was born with a gift, what they call a photographic memory. I was a straight-A student in school and every subject didn't have to study and my ambition at that time was to become a physician. I know today that God equipped me with everything necessary to become a physician, but apparently it was not in God's plan. And I'm glad today that he didn't allow me to become a doctor because knowing today, and I've been knowing it for a number of years, that I wanted to become a doctor for the wrong reason. I wanted to be a doctor so that the lives of other people would be in my hands and I could do to them what I thought that they had done to me. And I was a loner. I could isolate myself. And I remember I used to pray as a kid. Now this was before I ever drank the drug. So you see, I, I'm real sick. And I look normal tonight, don't I? I look real normal. You know, I'm normal to you all. But I remember praying as a kid a many nights and asking God to take the feeling away from me from people. And if he would do that, I'd never have it again. Now, Adam, I'm not saying that God did that because I, I don't know what God did. <laughs> See, that, that was part of my problem too. I'm trying to figure out what God going to do and couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do. <laughs> But I do know that after getting over that feeling of being rejected by my mother, that feeling told me that if I never got that close to another person again, I couldn't be hurt like that. So I began to protect myself from being hurt. I would share my body, my money, clothes, car, anything else. But I was a guy with my feelings and my inside that would say, come close with one hand and get back with the other. See, when you got too close to me, I would send you a message to get away. And if you didn't get away, I'd send a little stronger. Okay? And if you didn't go, then I would go. Always been a runner. So compound with all of these feelings. At the age of 15... I was faced with a situation where out of fear as I know it today that I uh, committed an act that got me five to seven years. It was a manslaughter charge and it was out of fear and it was out of trying to prove to other people. See, because I've always been small and never had anybody to fight for me or do anything like that. And I felt, always felt, inside, 
that I have to depend on me. And if I ran one time, I had to always run. And I recall in school, it was a boy in school that used to take all the little boys' lunch every day. Every day. Including mine. And I made a mistake one day and came home from school and told my granddad that I was hungry. And he wanted to know how I eat. And I told him about Baby Ray had been, had took my lunch and he had been taking it. And I'm looking for this sympathy from my granddad. Poor little thing. You know, I didn't get that. He told me how hard he worked. And if I come back there another day telling him about somebody took something for me, what he was going to take when I got that. <laughs> so I made up in my mind that day that, excuse the expression, that I would never take two ass whippings in the same day. <laughs> so what I did, I went back to school the next day. Now, this is what I thought I learned about people, see? And when all the little boys, see what he would do, he would bring two pistols to school and at lunch hour, it was a big stump way out from the school and he would sit in the middle of the stump with his two pistols and all of us had to march around the stump like ten soldiers and place our lunch bags on the stump and then go back and sit out there just like y'all sit. And he would look in the bag and eat what he wanted and what he didn't want and he'd take it to throw it away. And then he'd pick his pistols up and spin them on his finger like this wild Bill Hickok. <laughs> and he said, if you tell anybody, I'm going to kill you here. <laughs> and all of us were scared. And I was scared to death. But that day, when all the little boys marched around the stump and put their lunch bag up there, I didn't put mine up there, but I was scared. And he had to make an example out of me. So naturally... He re jumped out to grab me, and I guess that probably was the best fight I ever put up. I didn't beat him, and he didn't beat me. But the next day, who do you think was sitting on the stuff beside? <laughs> and he was telling the other little boys, say, you see how I was sitting here? That's my main man. <laughs> Any of y'all mess with him, I'm going to kill you here. <laughs> and I thought I had learned that all people want nothing but bluffs, you know. That's what I thought I'd learned. But see, that wasn't the truth. <laughs> that wasn't the truth. See, because if that had been the truth, along the way, I never would have got shot with shotguns and stabbed and knocked in the head with iron pipes and all that kind of stuff. See, it won't. See, uh, it won't that thought that I'm living today. See, they tried to send me away a long time ago. But I always felt that thing inside of me, whatever it is. And it's still there. I'm not one of those that say that uh, I come in AA and been washed white as snow. The book tells me that it's no matter how good a life, Al, you try to live, there's always going to be a part of you that opposes the will of God. And that took a lot of burden off me. My desire today and my desire before I drink has always been to do what I feel is my high pal's will. And today I don't know if I'm doing it or not. But I believe the desire to do it does please God. So I just keep trying. And as I begin to drink, like I read in Sanskrit, it describes my disease very well. It said a man makes a drink, the man takes the drink, then the drink takes the man. And that's what happened in my life. And switching from one drug to another is like changing seats on the Titanic. <laughs> I know a lot of y'all can identify with that. If I just stop drinking this vodka, I think I'll drink some soft wine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I said too. Or I'll just drink a little beer. Or I'll put a little lemon juice in it. Or I will eat a lot of eggs and I will do all of this and I'll do all of that. But see, if you didn't put the alcohol in it, you wouldn't have to worry about none of that. 
See, alcoholism, alcohol, and drugs allowed me to find a spot on this earth that I could exist. I believe that the feelings, the deep feelings of being depressed and the feelings of being isolated is what forced people like me to want to end it all. See, I never thought I was suicidal. See, but I was doing it on the installment plan. <laughs> this is a very destructive illness. And as I began to drink, and I said that I'd never get married, and to show you uh, uh, just a little bit about how sick mentally I was. Uh, when my wife got married, <laughs> you notice I've made a clear distinction. I used to say when I got married, see, but I didn't get married. I was already married. See, I had a wife. Alcohol and drugs. I was already married. I didn't know it. You understand? And I was giving my full time and attention and all my dedication to staying high. And I was a, about a two and a half hours late for the wedding. And I was drunk. I mean, I was, I had to be that way to get that. And everybody was gone except the minister, the mother-in-law, the father-in-law, and the two brother-in-law. And I don't remember, I don't remember saying I will, I can't, I won't, I don't remember none of that. But I remember, I can see the house right now, my, my former in-law's house. And we were sitting in the living room and here the new son-in-law sitting over here with the bride, right? And the mother-in-law, the father-in-law sitting over here. And you know how cunning and baffling we are. And all of a sudden, this thing hit, whatever it was. And I ran out of cigarettes. <laughs> and I told them that uh, I was going to the store to give me some cigarettes right at the corner. And I asked them, did they want anything? And they said, yeah, potatoes. You know, you know, the little tidbits, tidbits they said they wanted. And I left going to the store to get some cigarettes and some soda and potato chips and stuff. And it was six months. <laughs> Oh, she's seen me again. <laughs> now, <laughs> see, my, my ex-wife had a problem, too. She had to have a problem. I didn't sleep with her on the wet night, and when she saw me, she caught me in another tank. And she was to try to stick with me and to help me, and not knowing it, my illness has a way. Are making people that close to us and care about us start to feel responsible and guilty. And she began to wonder what was wrong with her. Something was wrong with her. And I would use all kinds of guilt feelings and still guilt feelings. See? And I didn't know until I was in A for a long time that if I allow any human being to make me feel guilty, they can manipulate me and use me. And I did not know how not to allow the people to make me feel guilty. And uh, so our marriage, our togetherness was, she put everything she could into it. But I had to live the life I had to live according to the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction. And it's one thing I didn't want to do. I didn't want to surrender. I never wanted to give up. I wanted to live a better life. But I also wanted to drink and drug. And I didn't know that the first step in wanting to be sober is to stop drinking. And as a result of my fears inside that I felt I had to protect that manhood, having this illness, it, uh, it led me to a lot of incarcerations, a lot of loneliness, a lot of separation. And I always felt that I was alone by myself. And what alcohol and drugs would do would give me temporary relief. And I could always live in this fantasy in my mind that tomorrow it's going to be different. And I never 
had any idea that how is it going to be any different tomorrow, Al, if you drinking and drugging today. You got to stop and stay stopped long enough to find out if you really want to be so. I had a lot of people that cared about me, but my illness forced those people away from me. You know, I was always kind of like a guy. I heard a guy tell a story once, and he said that uh, the average guy, if he started out that door right back there and a man was standing on the other side with a baseball bat and hit him upside the head, so the average human being, the normal person, would try to back up and figure what they're going to do. They'd maybe go out that window or go out this back door or decide to stay in here or whatever. Say, but he was the kind of guy that would keep going to that same door, getting hit in the head with that same bat, and if the man won't there, he'd stand there and wait on him. <laughs> That's the way I used to be as I look at my life. I didn't know I was doing this consciously. But see, I, I, I guess I was a masochist and a sadist all rest, wrapped up in one, you know. Uh, I recall one, and then again, see, I'm a guy that I love a lot of humor, and reading the literature allows me a lot of freedom. See, this is the joy of living. And as was mentioned, I was blessed that my anniversary date, June the 10th, was the same day of the birth of Alcoholics Anonymous. And through God's grace and the love of people like you all, God allowed me to live alcohol and drug free one day at a time for 17 years. And I'll be forever grateful to you all for that. So I began, I kept drinking. And, and I heard along the way the judges made me go to AA meetings, and the only thing I would hear at an AA meeting would be amen. That was all I would hear. <laughs> and I would hear people talk about what was happening to them, and I was one of those kind of people that would say to myself, yeah, well, that happened to them, but I got more sense than that. It ain't going to happen to me. <laughs> See, I was always suffered with the yet. So whatever you hear an AA member say, in a meeting, whether it's open, closed, or whatever kind, one-on-one, -on -one. if it ain't happened to you, make sure you say yes. Because I lay odds and bet you if you're an alcoholic and you keep drinking and don't die, what you hear happen to somebody else will happen to you. But don't die in the process now. Don't die while you try to find out. And I kept drinking, and it was a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And I guess basically maybe what I'm trying to say is that I'm not here tonight because of what I know. I'm here because of what I didn't know and what I still don't know. I don't know how to live alcohol and drug free by myself. My illness forces me to reach out to other people. God gave me the problem, gave you all the solutions. He didn't give me both of them. He gave me maybe the solution to somebody else's problem. You know, I remember the things that I read mean a lot to me, and they kind of register in my mind. You know, and when I look at myself, and I look at other people that I talk to, we are all somewhat nonconformists. We don't like to conform to rules and regulations and we don't like people in authority telling us what to do and when to do it and how to do it, you know. And a lot of us die trying to prove to people that we don't have to do what they say do, right? And being a nonconformist, I read some once, it was talking about the nonconforming sparrow. Say the group of sparrows, they was up around New York during the summertime. And they was frolicking and having a good time. And as fall of the year began to set in, all the sparrows decided that they do what nature tell them to do to fly south because it was going to get cold up there. But one particular sparrow, being a nonconformist, he was having such a good time, say like me. <laughs> he said, I let all them go on. I'm, I'm going to hang around here and have me some fun. 
And around about October, he noticed it was starting to get cold. So something told him he better try to catch up with the flock and get on down to Florida where it was warm. But see, when he got along about Philadelphia, it got real cold. And it started, and it started sleeting and hailing. And the little sparrow's wings froze on it. And the poor little sparrow fell right in the middle of a barnyard. And the little sparrow thought it was all over. Thought it was the end of it. And while he was laying there frozen, a cow came by. <laughs> and clapped on the little sparrow. And the crap warmed his wings. And he was so happy to get unfrozen, he started to chirping and making a lot of noise. And about that time, a cat walked by. And he heard the noise, and he went to investigate. And he scratched the crap back and looked in, and he saw the little sparrow, and he promptly ate him up. Now, the moral of the story is, everybody... That shit on your angel enemy. <laughs> and everybody that gets you out of shit ain't your friend. <laughs> and if you're warm and happy in a pile of shit, keep your mouth closed. <laughs> like that that helped me to keep my life simple today, see? <laughs> see? It's little things. I, I heard all this stuff today from a lot of the old times that had been through the trials and the tribulations and the ups and downs of life. Been through everything that you can mention and was able to do one thing that the book says. It says, Al, anytime you can't add no humor to your life, you're taking yourself too serious. This is the joy of living, not the joy of dying. Okay? And this thing has taught me, you know, how to live my life with all my faults and all my shortcomings and to recognize that the love of God in people and support of people, that just because I make a mistake, I'm not a mistake. Just because I feel insecure, I'm not insecure. Just because I feel inadequate, I'm not inadequate. I no longer allow my feelings to overrule my best intelligence. Today I'm able to do the things that, some of the things, the freedom that I search for, I always from a kid and I imagine all of us in our own particular way have looked for this elusive thing, this word we call happiness. I've always looked for and search for. And here about seven or eight months ago, in the calmness of what God had put in my soul, it was revealed to me that it won't because I was right or wrong or good or bad or anything else. Yeah, I needed happiness. Sure. But I was just going about it the wrong way. He said to me, Sal, Al, you ain't supposed to look for happiness. <laughs> Happiness is a byproduct of right living. You live right, and happiness is the payoff, is the reward. And I stand here today as a witness that the A, 12 steps, the principles of this program, has never let me down. And, and having always having a very low trust level, that's really what I mean when I say I don't trust you. I just really mean that I'm scared you're going to let me down. And that's why I stuck with alcohol and drugs for so long. Because I thought in its fantasy, in my imagination, it won't let me down. It was doing for me what I wanted it to do. But then it came a time when it stopped doing that. And I got to the point that the book speaks of, that when you can't live with it, and you can't live without it, and you have to jump an off point. Then what you gonna do? The more you drink, the sober you get. 
the more guilt you feel, the more remorse you feel. You know, what you going to do? And what happened to me, I guess what happened to me was something else that I read. I remember it came a point in, in my life where I'd had a lot of the things that I thought would make me happy. The money, the women, the jewelry, the car. Always thought that, you know, I could take care of myself. But as I know today, God loved me. And I remember one night I was walking through an alley off 14th Street. And I had a fifth of wine. Wild eyes rose. I know that none of y'all in here never drank it. <laughs> but that's the wine that never seen a grape. <laughs> I don't believe they can grow them that fast. Not fast as people drink. Now, if you want to hurry up and get the egg quick, don't drink the good scotch and the bourbon and all that. Just drink wild ice rose. It'll get you here quick. And at this point in my life, uh, the wife had been gone, the kids. I didn't have any family. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any money. I was staying in an empty house. Uh, I was more mentally and physically sick. And I was walking through the alley. And I had a fifth of wine in one hand. And I had my pistol in the other hand. And I was hoping that somebody would jump out one of the side alleys and try to rob me. Now, what was going to rob me up? But, I mean, this is a mental sickness. And I did something that I'd always promised myself I would never do. I cursed God in that house. And I cursed God and I challenged him to kill me in that house. And I'm not saying this to try to prove it to anybody. You know, I'm just telling you what happened to me. The instant that I did that, I believe I was more sober then than I am tonight. It was if I had never drank or drugged in my life. All the alcohol and drug, everything just went right out of my body just like that. And a thought came in my mind. And the thought in my mind say, very quickly, I'm not going to kill you. Because if I kill you, you'll be God. Because I'll be doing what you say do. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to let you suffer till you do something you ain't never done before. And that's ask somebody to help you. And I walked out the end of that alley. And I finished drinking that wine. And it was like drinking water. And I didn't stop drinking right away. But up to that point, I'd been kind of able to come up a little bit when I got out. But it was downhill all the way from that time on. And you know, they say we have spiritual, there are many kinds of spiritual awakenings. The book says there are people in there. And what is a spiritual awakening? Is any time something happens for me, good, that I know I could not do for myself. And it came a time when I wound up in district jail for what I hope was the last time. And as I look at that point in my life, it was like a circle. I thought it was the end. But I guess when you look at a circle, what you think is the end could be the beginning. And apparently that was the beginning for me. Because I was told by my attorneys and everybody that the court was not going to give me no break. I wanted to go back to jail. And I told myself that maybe, Al, you can learn how to come out and live like a decent human being. At this time, alcohol had me very violent. Well, I was violent anyway, because I carried a lot of hate and a lot of revenge. Always did. I thought it was the world on my back, you know. And the judge turned me loose when they brought me from the jail that morning. And I was walking down F Street. And when I got to 14th and F, a thought ran in my mind. And the thought said real quickly, it say, you know you wanted to go back to the penitentiary this morning and the judge wouldn't even send you when the hell you going. And I couldn't answer that, so I just kept walking. Something stopped me dead in my track. And another thought ran through my mind. And it say, you're headed right back where you just left if you go back. It may be your last time, so you alcoholic. It's an A club over there on 12th Street. So go over there and ask somebody to help you. And I just turned and walked through the park. 
up the steps to the old Metropolis Club when it was on 12th Street. And when I walked into that club, it was like walking into a new way of life. I didn't know it at the time. Nobody knew me, and I didn't know them. But they reached out to me. They offered me a cup of coffee. And one of the guys told the other one how sick I was. And I couldn't understand how he could tell that, because I hadn't had nothing in 13 days because I'd been locked up. But I know today he could see my soul sickness because he was an alcoholic just like me. And I was given some instructions by the guy that was a powerful example for me. And he gave me a prescription just like a doctor gives you a prescription. And he said, Al, I'm going to give you a prescription for getting sober and staying sober. He said, don't take a drink or a drug today. Attend an AA meeting and make an AA contact today. Say, find you a power greater than yourself and say thanks to that power. And say, try to help somebody with no strings attached. And I guarantee you that you never will have to drink again a day at a time as long as you live. But you're going to have to deal with sobriety every day. And see, I know what he's talking about now when he said dealing with sobriety every day. I ain't drinking alcohol, but a lot of times I drink jealousy, and I drink a lot of anger. See, I'm one that believes you can get drunk in January and take the drink in June. All you got to do is just keep drinking a lot of jealousy and resentment. You keep drinking that, and if you're alcoholic, you're going to drink alcohol. See, because that's the only thing that's going to temporarily put out the pain. And he gave me that prescription, and through God's grace and you all's support, I've been able to follow it one day at a time. You know, it's, uh, I read something once, and as I say, it's a gift, and I guess when I really look at it, it really struck me. And all of you have read it, but I like to say it. Before I close, because it meant so much to me, and I carried around inside. See, because it's not other people, other places, and other things. See, my illness is the inside, y'all, right? And I'm really here because I'm not all there, okay? And I don't have the answers to the living problems of life. I have to reach out and ask other people. Because where I'm weak, someone else got the strength. And where they weak, somebody else got the strength. And I see a relationship between two brothers, two sisters, a man and a woman or whatever. If you notice the people that seem to get along as couples, with all their houses alike, apparently in their own way, they use each other's weaknesses as their strengths. And if two people put, if I put my strength where your weakness is, and you put your strength where my weakness is, that makes two people one strong person. And the outside things that usually tear us apart, don't do that. Me of myself, I'm not. You know, this poem about the man in the glass. It really struck me, and I, I cursed it around with me. And I think it goes something like this. When you get what you want in struggle for self, and the world makes you king for a day, just go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that man got to say. For it's not your brother, your mother, your sister or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. Say the one whose verdict counts most in your life is the one stand back from the back. He's the one to please, never mind all the rest, for he'll be with you clear up to the end. And you pass your most dangerous, difficult test if the man in the glass is your friend. The world may call you a straight shooting chum and say you're a hell of a guy, <laughs> but the man in the glass say you're only a bum if you can't look him straight now. <laughs> 
You may fool the whole world down your pathway of years and get pats on your back as you pass. But your final reward will be hearty and kids if you cheated the man in the glass. You know, when I'm faced with life trials and tribulations like all people, that's one thing I try to focus in on that I can't cheat at. See, money is good, but I've never seen a drink truck follow a hearse either. <laughs> Whatever you got on this little ball here, when you leave here, you know, it's going to stay here. And there's a couple other little things that mean a lot to me. And I don't believe, for me, this is just Al speaking, that God gives me these insights for me. Because who am I? I don't believe God cares anymore about me than he do any other human being in this world. But I believe he gives it to me like he gives it to many of us to share it with somebody else. And if I refuse to share what is given to me, I'm going to lose it. Sobriety is the same way. It's the same way. And you know, I heard a lady read a poem by me wanting to hold on. She read a poem, and I never heard it for one time, and I wouldn't know the lady today if I saw her. And that struck me, because I've always wanted to be a person to control, to be in charge. And I found out that God didn't go on vacation and leave me in charge, or no other human being in charge. That he's still in charge, and he's doing good. In fact, he's doing excellent. <laughs> he's doing for me what I can't do for myself. And when the lady read this poem, she read it, and it says, uh, as children bring their broken toys in tears for us to men, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. Instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help in ways that was my own. At last I snatched them back and cried, How can you be so slow? My child, he said, What could I do? You never did let go. And I'm a person that will grab a hot pan off the stove. See, now this is what normal people do. If they grab a hot pan off the stove, they will sit it down. <laughs> but me, I'm very brilliant. I want to be in charge. And once I put my hand on something, I've got to control it. So rather than to sit it down, I'll change it to the other hand. <laughs> That's what I do. See, I don't want to let go. See, I want to, I want to change everything out there. I want to change all of y'all, the weather, the bog, everything. But I want to hold on to the cause of it in here. See, I don't want to let this go. And I've learned in this fellow, blessed fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that this is a gift. And at the end of Hyde Works probably sums up the whole thing of trying to live a sober life. It say it made clear three pertinent ideas. A that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own life that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism and that God could and would if he was sought. I'm going to share this last thing and I'm going to sit down because there again was a gift that I look at because I'm in this constant search to find something, to feel that emptiness when nothing else fills it. So this guy went to India and he went to this Swami and he said to the Swami, he said, I'm looking for to trying to find God. Say, how can I find God? And so the Swami told him, say, come on, let's take a walk. And while they were walking, he got so interested in what the Swami was saying that he forgot where he was walking. And he walked out in the Ganges River. 
And when they got out about waist deep in the water, the Swami reached over and grabbed his head and held it under the water. And he started to get up. A few, few seconds, the Swami let his head up and said to him, Say, when I had your head under the water, so what did you want more than anything else in the world? He said, I wanted to breathe. He said, well, when you want to find God, as bad as you wanted to breathe, say you were fine. And I think that's for fame. See, this disease will force me, the nature of my illness will force me to find something outside of myself that's greater than me. I either do it or I die as a direct result of my illness. And in one of the A pamphlets, this guy had 17 years in A, and he was giving a talk to a general audience. And those of you who read the Bible a little bit, and this ain't got nothing to do with religion, yet it's got something to do with everything. And he was, at the end of his story, he was talking about the miracles that Christ performed. You know, giving sight to the blind, healing the lame and the crippled. And this is what he said. He said, if you ask me, what have I found the last 17 years since being in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, I will tell you then, and I will tell you now, that the blind do see, that the deaf do hear, that the lame do talk. And somewhere during the darkest night and the longest day, the poor in spirit have the good news brought to them. And God grant that it'll always be so. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.